Welcome to the PowerShell Podcast, the podcast for PowerShell and the PowerShell community. Far more powerful than all the others. And now, here's your hosts, Jordan Hammond and Andrew Plaw. Hey everybody, welcome to the PowerShell Podcast. I'm mediocre host, Jordan, with Ultra Mega Superstar, Andrew. What's up? And, and we're back with uh, another... Uh, I am, I'm loving this podcast. Like, I've always enjoyed it, but recently, it's starting to feel like we're hitting a... We're hitting a rhythm here, a groove. Definitely are. We're hitting that groove, man. We're, we're finding, we're trying new things. Some things are working, some things aren't. We're learning. We're, we're crafting our style. It's a good time. Yeah, we, we tried this version out last week, and Kelly's notes were, eh, it's all right, just don't run too long. So <laughs> let's, let's jump right in. We have a, a blog we wanted to highlight. Yeah, an awesome blog by an awesome person. Who is this person? It's Jordan. Brock. That's our friend. We work That's with right. that guy, right? We do, yep. He... uh. He he writes blogs for us full time. He's new to PowerShell, but he he tackles big subjects and he just dives in and learns all of it. So the blog that's out there right now is he's all about loops, and it's it's fantastic. I recommend we'll put the link down below. We were, I recommend you go to go to and give that one a read. It's pretty good. Yeah, it's definitely good. Um, I like Brock because he has you can hear his voice in his blogs. Like it makes it actually interesting, which isn't always the approach that I've taken whenever I've written blogs. Um, so shout out Brock. We got to get him as a guest sometime because it's really interesting to see him grow at PowerShell. Cause in my opinion, he's pretty legit now. Like he sees some things and shows them to me. I'm like, dang man, you're really in this PowerShell thing. Yeah. He hit me up about, he had put in a uh, calculated property. He wasn't mm -hmm. sure what it was. He's just making sure that, is that the right thing? It's like you just stumbled on something pretty awesome there. So it was pretty yep. cool to see. Uh, see, the other news is you're you're officially paid to do the podcast. That's a nice change for you. Yep, I'm officially joining uh, the likes of Jordan. <laughs> Real professional. All right. Uh, with that, out of the way, what did you bring on our guest? I got a request real quick. Okay. Speaker request. You know, I mentioned it before on the podcast. Deep in them. But I'll put it up front here. Gainesville PowerShell user group is looking for speakers. Um, we'd love to have some remote speakers, some first-time people. We'll get you in. We'll make an event around it. doesn't have to be too long of a presentation. I'm happy to work with you on a subject. Hit us up. Right. Now, Jordan, we got something way bigger than just you and I. We do. We, we have... Got, uh, we got, uh, he's author, MVP, <sighs> new dad. I mean, I think he's been a dad for a while, but he's new dad. Two again. time. Two, two time. time. Twice right. as nice. Hey, everybody, welcome Michael Zanata. G'day, everybody. How you going? <laughs> it's awesome to have you here. So you said this the book that you just wrote. It, I'm sorry, I have the name up. I just have to read it. So, uh, Modern <laughs> IT Automation with PowerShell. Yes. That um, one so is oh, go a ahead. community textbook. Music. Okay. Yeah. Um, that is. Basically, it's a textbook written by the community for the community. That's as simple as it uh, can be. Um, but the idea is, is that um, the book um, focuses on extension on the framework of um, mod oh, sorry, um, with PowerShell conference book. PowerShell. Oh, it's it's more along the lines of the it's. It's a kind of deviation from the PowerShell conference book, and it's kind of a start over or a do over. Um, it starts with the um, it, it, you start off. It, essentially, it's kind of that PowerShell journey. So we start off with the um, um, month of lunches, tool making. This is kind of that next book where it really focuses on more of that commercial space on um, what you actually do with PowerShell in a commercial setting. So it's you've learned you've, you've learned enough to be dangerous. Now let's go and actually kind of constrain it a little bit so that you then know how to be dangerous safely. That's really a great antithesis for the book. I, I like that. Be dangerous safely. Yeah. That's a... So it's more of a, a journey. Like you're taking them from point A to point B kind of deal. And uh, it's, it's whereas the conference book was more of like a hodgepodge of different topics within different categories. Um, it's more structured. Topic? Yeah, it's more structured. Right. So conference book is, yeah, single single chapter, specific topic. Um, we have migrated away from that into more formalized chapters. So, um, you know, the first chapter is about collab. Oh, the first section is about collaboration. So we look at Git. We look at, you know, um, how to actually do code reviews, things like that, um, because these are, these are key elements, um, especially when you're writing code that you might not be exposed to that you're going to need to know 
in a commercial setting. Um, things like um, advanced PowerShell, how to refactor, excuse me, how to refactor PowerShell in a way that's, um, you know, more readable, maintainable, um, testable, how to actually write unit tests, different types of unit testing. So, you know, um, and mocking, things like that. So it kind of, it's a broad thing. And actually the other one, which is security as well, really focusing on PowerShell security. And I think that's been a bit, little bit of a neglected area. Um, so we've we're starting to put a lot more investment in that um, around, you know, how to actually set up um, constrained language mode with AppLock or um, with an Intune, how to, um, implement and enforce session configurations, you know, around that, uh, around PowerShell remoting, um, these kinds of areas that we really wanted to focus into. And there's a kind of, you know, and there's just really, really good little nuggets around there that things that you just, it's it's really handy to know. So things like SDDLs, um, um, where you can, um, you know, go down the rabbit hole and actually learn a little bit more about how, how ACEs and ACLs work. Um, and you can apply those to your session configuration and just basic things as well, like, you know, advanced, advanced conditions within PowerShell. So things like how to use the, you know, the contains operator or the in operator, you know, other things like bitwise operators. So we, you know, spend a, a fair bit of time in that and then talking about, um, you know, when you do an XOR uh, with int 32 type or with an int 32, why is it actually giving you a completely different answer? Um, and we talk a little bit about signed and unsigned integers. So it kind of starts to delve into those, you know, those more developer topics so that, you know, a, when you kind of read the book, you go, okay, I get a lot more of the advanced stuff, but it's not too much where you're feeling overwhelmed and you can take it at your own pace. And it, the best part about this book as well is it's structured so that learning um, institutions, if they want to pick up the book, they can basically say, hey, we can teach this from you know point A to point B because it takes you on that journey. So you learn the basics like Git, collaboration, things like that. And then you progress in lots more of those advanced topics and you finish up with a nice round um, ending of our security so yeah the security is a, a nice touch that's a every time we have a guest that's security focused it's it's pretty popular yeah so it, it's almost like that one is all right you've started to learn powershell you've started to build some automation in your environment now, now read this book so you can go through and see what you have to correct yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's a that's a really great way to to, to approach it. Um, it what, it's it's a, it's a kind of funny story because it's it's not just appropriate just to PowerShell. Like it's um, a lot of the collaboration side of things is more focused and tailored towards just general you know development. So um, at work at the moment, I'm basically you know there's there's a lot of people that are saying you know we're moving them into um, a workflow a Git workflow structure away from. Um, team foundation version control. So we're moving them into Git. And I was like, this this book, the first, the first, you know, first couple of chapters, you guys will own it. You just need to read that book. Um, but they are, but it, it's 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 a really, really it's it's really interesting because it's just um different areas and different teams are going to be able to utilize that book. You know, the SecOps guys will be able to look at the security side of things and go, okay, you know, this makes sense. This is how to actually structure it formally to be as secure as possible. And I can look at these other um, these other modules to help supplement um, any sort of additional security with it. You've got the, you know, um, if, you, if you've got a guy who's just, you know, 100% focused in PowerShell, you know, he, he doesn't know how to write unit tests or he doesn't know how to, um, you know, structure um, code in a way that is uh, maintainable and testable, um, there's, there's a little section for him. But the whole idea is that there's a big journey on that. So, yeah. That's huge. I would have loved to have had that in my previous job. Um, I can imagine so many good use cases for a book like this. It mm. seems like by capturing the expertise of the community, um, you can sort of have like a technical mentor to help you with some of these topics that maybe are not implemented in your organization. And this is, we talk about this a lot, Jordan, kind of a source of authority you can use to kind of bring in and say, hey, here's how things probably should be done. It doesn't look like we're approaching things in this manner. Um, it, it just gives you a starting point where if you don't have someone more advanced, technically they can't kind of give you that huge book. Very cool. So I got yeah. it. And it's not complete easy. either. It's not complete. We've really? this is the first edition. Yeah. We've got a lot more to add to it. 
Um, and there's a lot of little secret things that we're wanting to do as well um, that I'm not going to reveal yet because it might annoy. Um, we, we have I haven't fully discussed with James um, James uh, James yet, um, but the idea is is that um, yeah we've got some we we want to make it um, we want to make it as um, accessible for everyone as possible, and we were trying to thinking thinking and brainstorming of ways to do that, but lots of work involved in that book and um yeah it's so actually i was just quickly i was going to go a quick segue it's actually really really interesting with lean pub um is that lean pub doesn't have an indexing service um so um one of the guys on um on the team um huge shout out um to um nick bissell um he's a he's he works in the medicine field but he's a powershell gun and then regex extraordinaire like there's a whole a whole section on regex and it's really good um and so we didn't have our own we didn't have our own um indexing process we needed to write an index for a textbook like it's a textbook we're gonna write up an index for it so we just wrote our own and he basically it's it's really really interesting because what he had to do is you had to actually go and download the production copy of the um pdf go through essentially a csv file of annotations that we needed to add into that dynamically search the book with regex and then be able to actually automatically construct from Markdown in Markdown the actual um, index um, table into your current commit. It's really, really interesting. Wow. Automation. Jeez. Yeah. He's awesome. But man, Regex is just one of those. I'm every time there's someone's like, oh, he's awesome at Regex, I instantly respect that person way more. Just out of the, they they have a default respect that's uh, the about as high as you can get. Yep. Absolutely. It's, it's one of those things that, um, you can, it, it takes, it, it, like I personally, I'm, I'm okay at regex. I don't generally just jump on the regex, you know, um, test there and then I muck around within it. He's just like banging out these expressions that are just, you know, like perfect. <laughs> That's always uh, fun to see. I, I would definitely, I'm going to end up with this book because the security mm. side, I did a, a webcast on constrained language mode and mm. The resources for this, even as important as it is, where it's almost getting, becoming mandatory, there's mm. not a lot of resources on how to do it. I, I leaned heavily on, I want to say the blog was by Lee Holmes. Yep. He did one that I leaned heavily on that. And then when I went to do the live version of it, when my testing, I had enabled it with no exceptions allowed, so I couldn't run any of my PowerShell anywhere. <laughs> so I, I, was able, I was able to work through that and uh, get it trouble here. And, and, uh, you know, go through the process of getting all set up, but it's one of those things where it's becoming almost mandatory and there's still not a lot of information on everything about it. So it's to uh, the end of the book alone, it makes it worth a purchase in my mind. Yeah. The one thing that, um, and this is actually, uh, kind of, a, a bit of a, um, a, a like to see within constrained language mode is, um, within PowerShell session configuration, you can set or define the language mode. So, um, it can be no language, um, it's no language, full language constrained. And there's another one, what's it restricted? Um, and the idea is, is that, um, you can actually set the language mode. And that's one thing I would really like to see in the console itself. So it's not just bound to constrain language mode. It's just you as administrator can basically say, all right, let's take the session configuration that you have, you know, for a PowerShell remoting session and let's apply it to a console. So it means that you can only run these commandlets. You can do X, Y, and Z. And the thing is, is the, the session configuration, um, the role capability files that you can attach to a session configuration, you can dynamically build them out based on RBAC. You can apply RBAC over the top of them using with an Active Directory. So it just means that within that space, you can, dynamically control and massage your session configuration according to a user's requirements so it's not specifically set to a um you know here's a language configuration and that's it you know one size fits all, uh, fits all. it's a dynamic um a dynamic environment where each user has its own configuration that's applied from a role capability so so with that if it's on the console uh, I mean, part of the people doing it through policy is you can't mm. just run PowerShell as bypass. If if you set it yeah. on the console level, could you just do bypass and get around constrained language mode? No, 
No. Constraint oh. link, no. So the way constraint language mode works under the hood is when PowerShell fires up. Um, okay. If you have app locker or you have Intune enforced, um, the way that PowerShell works when it fires up, and this is actually one of the things it does in the book, it does a deep dive into constraint language mode and looks at the C sharp logic. Um, it essentially looks at the PowerShell process looks, essentially it uses, um, it looks for an app locker policy and Intune uses app locker under the hood, just saying. Um, but the way that it looks for an app locker policy and if, the, if a policy, it essentially creates a file and if that policy, if that file has an access denied, it knows that policy has been enforced. And then what it does is it basically sets the language mode to constrain mode. So what then happens is everything after that then um, transpires. And it's kind of interesting though, because if you look into the logic of new, um, for instance, new object, you can actually see there's a specific condition in within there. It says if, you know, if language mode is constrained language mode, um, you know, do this. And okay. so it, it allows you to, um, it, there's there's specific logic in there that basically controls the outcome of the language mode. So, yeah. Okay, but that, that's, and I was definitely off base on that one because I always assumed mm. it was similar like with the way the profile loads. So if you do something machine or user specific, just bypass gets by it. And then nope. anything set by policy. So it's not that way. That's fantastic to hear that. Mm. Because being Language, able to have yeah. granular control is a big deal, I think, especially yeah. something like that. So the only way you can bypass it is if you have an app locker policy in place that basically has a publisher rule, a script rule, or file rule in place that basically says, I am allowing this script to run or I'm allowing this file to run. Then you can go to that file and run it. And then if you basically um, had, you know, I think it's um, session state dot, um, I can't remember the exact property part, <laughs> the object part, but if you go and actually show what mode it is in, then it will run it in the correct mode. So there is, you can still, it, it's just those policies within AppLocker control, um, the, control the execution and that will run in full language mode if they're allowed to run. But as a rule of thumb, the best way to do it is use certificates. So sign your code, um, sign your code, that's, that's a biggie. Um, and then use those code signing certificates um, as a publisher rule, and that will help you enable, allow what scripts are enabled within your organization. You can still have some issues with um, other modules and third-party dependencies, but it's a good start anyway, and you can kind of narrow it down that way. Did you write these chapters on this constrained language mode part? I I, I write the constrained language mode chapter, yeah. Okay, okay. I'm like, dang, yeah, like, how involved were you? Like, I, can't, I can't just dump you. I give you bad information. It's like, no, you're wrong, which I'm used to hearing. That's, that's a default for me. But the, the last part is make sure you don't allow PowerShell version 2. Otherwise, constrained absolutely, language mode means absolutely. nothing. Absolutely. It means nothing. It yeah. means absolutely nothing. Get rid of that. That that, that shouldn't even be on your computer. I yeah, love like, this guy, George. Yeah. Shift yeah. delete it. Yeah, I, yeah, I believe it's a, it's a DLL. You, you can either prevent the DLL from loading or remove the DLL. I don't know about removing. I'm going to say prevent it from loading works. You can and, just remove the feature. Remove the feature? Okay. Just remove the feature. That's and, it. And they can't re-add it because if it's just like a, a simple add role type thing to get it back in there or? They need administrative privileges to do uh, that. Okay. Yeah. If, you can, at the end of the day though, it's like you could, if you really wanted to, yeah, you can, you can go the extra mile and explicitly block it. Um, Microsoft basically just say, just remove the feature. Just just untick that button. You're good to yeah. go. Well, well, clearly you are the expert on this all. I'll, I'll, I hope so. I'll believe you. <laughs> <laughs> Man, that book, Jordan. Yeah. In my opinion, and I don't, you know, I can't say this 100%, but I feel like if you're an IT professional doing things with PowerShell, uh, you're going to want to have this reference. You're going to want, I mean, I'm, it doesn't, I don't think many people, from my impressions of the state of the world, I don't think many people are executing on all the things that are contained in the book that we've just discussed so far. There's mm. so much value in there. My goodness. The one thing about constrained language mode, and this is something that I say, is that there's still wiggle room. And this is one of the reasons why I say um, I would like to see it. You can set configuration like PowerShell remoting and session configuration. Or I say session configuration because that's what the command let's say, but JEA, um, the um, session configuration file, like taking that and applying it to the console, that's what I want to be able to do because um, right. there's still wiggle room in there. And I don't like wiggle room. As a security guy, um, if I put my security hat on, I go, wiggle room is bad. Like you can still do stuff. You can still do invoke web requests. That being said, and I kind of make a comment in this book, there's a really good module um, 
by um, Adam Discroll called PowerShell Protect. And essentially what it does is it hooks into the um, anti-malware scan interface, AMSI, um, and it allows you to pre-pass and review executed code to a pre-executed code and whether to allow it or not. It's quite interesting. Um, and this is it's actually, it, this is something that I was thinking about a lot more is that you can hypothetically take that um, AMSI um, capabilities. And then the idea is that what you can do is use, um, um, essentially develop an AI to look at the logic of malicious code. So train the AI on malicious code and say, these this code is malicious, and then train an AI on code that basically says, this code is known as safe. And you can essentially you know, use the PowerShell gallery to do that. And then the idea is that you can use that AI to be able to help provide an additional layer of security that sits on top to protect against those kinds of third party, you know, um, um, AI, um, um, third party malicious code execution. So it's not looking for specific, um, you know, commandlets. It's looking for a specific behavior. And a lot of those behaviors are associated with like, you know, byte arrays. So they'll basically take a full byte array and then, you know, break it out. So, you know, the commandlet is essentially within a byte array and then they'll concatenate that and then execute that. Um, so it's looking for behaviors around that um, to prevent code from ex being executed. Huge. So you said for the community, by the community, you yep. mentioned you wrote the constrained language mode chapters. Yep. Were there other people that wrote different chapters? A lot of contributors yes. to this? Yes, yeah, so there was a few people um, I, I, um, in the book. Okay. If you, yeah, yeah there, there's there's so that. many there's so many contributors. Yeah. I, um, I, I can I'm just gonna kind of name a couple. Like my wife helped out with the cover art, so she did all the cover art. Um, we got Alan. Um, we had um, Bill Kindle. We had Chad Christian Covenanty, um, Greg. Um, I'm just like Jordan as a technical. There's there's so many different people. Kevin. Um, we've got Kieran Jacobson, Krill, and Matt Core, um, Martha Clancy, massive, a huge list of authors. Um, and you can essentially go and have a look in there. There's a huge, um, there's literally, you know, I would say a good couple of pages of just authors and bios and, and editors and bios and, you know, quality editors and things like that. And that was, yeah, it's, it's, it's a, um, yeah, so you can go through and have a bit of a read there. But I, I started off as a uh, um, as kind of like the editor in chief, and then I just kind of decided that I was I wanted to write the constrained language mode chapter because security interests me. And then um, um, we had some authors pull out, and I was like, "Yeah, I'll write that," you know. And so that was I wrote the the session configuration chapter or the JEA chapter, and really got you know got my teeth stuck into the deep dive onto that, and that was um, you know really, really interesting. And then it was like, hey, let's do, you know, I, I wrote the advanced functions and then the um, refactoring PowerShell. So um, chapters as well. So it's, it's uh, but there, there's, you know, you know, um, Nick wrote all regex, wrote all the regex stuff. Um, but yeah, there, there's a lot of, yeah, huge shout out to a lot of people. I know Matt Core did a, a ton of work with the unit testing side of things. So yeah, it's, nice. it's, it's a massive effort from everyone. Well, congrats and shout Thank out to you. everybody who contributed. But yes. man, spearheading an effort like this, especially in the time period of the world where mm. you were working on this for the bulk of it, man, kudos to you. Um, <laughs> huge kudos to you, really, for on behalf of the whole community. I don't know if mm. I can technically do that, but man, mm. really, really amazing effort. We're so fortunate to now have this as a result of those efforts. Mm. And I'm sure there was a ton of effort you put in, a lot of following up with people probably. Um, so thanks so much for that, man. And and so uh, are you getting rich off this or what? It's all going it's all going to charity. What a nice guy. What? It's yeah, tell us about charity. that. It's going to the on ramp, right? It's going to on ramp. Yep. All all proceeds are going to on ramp. I don't get a cent. None of the authors or anyone gets a cent. They all donated their time for this book. That's huge. And so again, it's you're not supporting us. You're not supporting um, um, the authors, anyone. You're supporting the community. And I think that's why I'm saying it's by the community, for the community. 
That's huge. In every way, shape and form, which is fantastic. Yeah. And and I think that, you know, having people that in authors and editors and linguistic editors to, don to donate their time, huge thank you to those guys and girls um, because it's just an amazing, um, they've just done an amazing job. That's awesome. If you're listening to this, you have access to budget or you have spare money, buy this. But particularly, I think most people are able to hopefully expense a book. Definitely get this on your shelves. Your organization would be better for it. I think that if you were to just get one small tip from it, it's worth the cost of admission, let alone being able to use it to get a better perspective on areas that you don't have experience in. Because based mm. on the breadth of the book, I don't know if anyone would have ex all those experience. Like what person exists that understands all that and has actually mm. gone through all that? And that's, it's one of the things that, yeah, it's, it's, there is so much content in there. And I think that the key thing is, is that what we're wanting to move towards is having um, learning materials as well. So we're gonna basically create a labs um, book going forward, add the second edition. Um, we've got um, a whole bunch of other things we're wanting to do with that as well. We're thinking about creating a teaching manual, um, but that might be third edition. Um, but the idea is, is that we just want to you know, put as much as we can into this book so that people are better informed. And it's, you don't have to go and buy the paperback um, copy. Um, you can get it on Lean Pub. It's a lot cheaper. And the reason why is because of printing costs. So, <clears throat> um, and the one thing you can do as well is if you um, subscribe to Lean Pub's email, they might send you some coupon codes um, and you can also get a discount over that as well. But um, it's definitely worth, um, it's definitely worth investing in that book. Um, you're going to learn a lot. And by the community, not by one opinionated person, right? Mm. There's a, it's a generally accepted best practices kind of deal. It's not. And, one and, that, and that's the thing that was really interesting in the PR. So we did this book using um, GitHub. This book was written in Markdown. We, so we had pull requests um, and the collaboration that was happening in the pull requests was insane. It was insane. We had pull requests that had over 300 comments in them. Um, so I, I did a quick, <laughs> quick count, 26 contributors. For the book that's that's some good collaboration that's what we're all about collaboration i think that's awesome mm. wow. it was it's it's a lot of work um but it, it's totally worth it in the end and it's actually something that you like you said earlier you touched on earlier was that we were struggling um and like personally i was struggling as well with the the scope of this book and the ambitious nature of it and me being a um a pretty um i i, I love i love to take ownership of, of something and I will run that thing to the very end. And so I just, like, I I was at the point where I was talking with my wife and I was saying, mm, do we continue with this? Do we not continue with this? And we thought about, like, we discussed it and I just thought, hell with it. I'm gonna see this thing through. The reason why is because come hell or high water, I want this book published. Um, and so we're just gonna do whatever it needs to be done to get it over the line. And it's just, it's very fortunate that um, we've had, I have to work with some amazing people that really, really helped me get that book over the line and huge thank you to everybody who contributed to the book. Um, your efforts made this book possible. Dude, such a huge accomplishment. Mm. I, I mean, I, I try not to say beautiful too much cause I get too, uh, thinking about the big picture, but man, it's such a beautiful thing to see so many people mm. coming together, paying it forward on the same page, contributing to something better. And now after, you know, you mentioned having kind of a deciding moment, is this right? I mean, mm. that doesn't surprise me to hear. I was kind of expecting, I didn't know if I wanted to bring up like, hey, what were some of the challenging moments? Mm. It's such an ambitious thing. Uh, I, I couldn't imagine there not being like, cause it's such a big undertaking. Um, and now to be on the other end of it, oh my goodness, that's mm. huge. And not really the other end. You said it's still in progress, but yeah. you know, you have a great thing to build on now. That's exactly right. Um, we've got now a platform to build on. And it's not as it's not as an arduous pro, uh, process now. We can we have something to work with. So and that and that that's the most important thing, dude. And I, we need this. I, I like how it, it's selfless on two sides because all the all the time spent into it was a selfless act just to get people that knowledge. The other side is the goes to the on ramp. We just talked to mm. Jeff Hicks, who mm. runs on ramp, about how important it is. More scholarships for that is a huge opportunity for a lot of people. So I, like everything about this book is just pure good 
making the world better. You, you don't run into a lot of pure good out there. Just trying to make the just trying to make a difference. That's it. <laughs> and we're lucky. We're lucky that you are trying. The community is very lucky for that. So awesome. Love to see it. Love to see it. Definitely check out the book. Link yeah. in the show notes down here. And there's it's also on Amazon as well. So um, don't be you afraid if you. If you yeah, if you want a hard copy, it's 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 a thick one. It's a thick one, like I can see um, just back there. That's the mm -hmm. book there. Um, it, it, you can you can use it to work out with as well. So there's an extra, you know, uh, positive thing. If you needed to get fit, you've got a really heavy textbook to work with. Um, I, I recommend don't reading in bed, holding it up because if you get tired, it might hit you in the face. Um, but yeah, <laughs> that's me with my phone every single night. What's going on? <laughs> I'll be watching something with my wife and she knows that eventually it's just coming down. <laughs> so if you don't mind me going back, you mentioned a couple of times, uh, just enough administration. Yep. Like, are, what, it seems to be a common hurdle for that's going to be initial adoption because by its very nature, you have to be over restricted to start because you don't know what people need access to, but you do have to remove things they don't. So. It seems to me that you're going to hit a lot of roadblocks where people are going to lose stuff you didn't know they needed. How how do you mm -hmm. get past that to get that fully implemented where you're going to get so much pushback? So there's two ways. It unfortunately um within JA you don't have um the audit capability within, you know, App Locker. So you can essentially review those event logs. Um the key thing is that it's going to have to work with those end users. That being said, what you can do is you can integrate um, the um, you can integrate those changes into unit testing for when you uh, uh, to test your um, session configuration within JEA. So, for instance, what I mean by that is that what you can do is you can go, all right, this user has these um, has these specific permissions. They can run these commands. So you can then write a unit test to test for that specific thing when you actually set up your role capability files, when you set up your Active Directory, our back environment, or when you have your our back environment and you integrate those changes into, um, integrate that into your session configuration, um, you can test for that. There's unit testing that you can help, that will help you show and give that visibility to what is there and what isn't there. Um, and I think with the PowerShell side of things as well, because it's such a fairly small aspect of it in terms of um, there's only a certain number of groups that usually are going to have access to a remote system. Um, it's it's not it, it's not going to be as a, a, a bigger impact um, to the wider automation side of things. Um, there's still going to be a lot of changes that have been required, especially if you're you know invoking a command or you're doing any sort of remote execution. That's going to have to be, you know, your existing code is going to have to be updated to point to a specific configuration source. Um, but at the end of the day, though, it's um, you can test that. And that's the key thing is that. So unfortunately, you're going to have to work with those teams and say, hey, what do you run? And then basically from that, you can then write unit testing um, to test the capability of those files to ensure that they have that capability um, to be able to execute those uh, specific items. It seems like implementing GA is going to lean heavily onto some soft skills. You have to communicate yes. really well what you're doing and give them foreknowledge. Say, hey, please let me know if you notice anything break. Like communication, it, it, it seems. Yeah, it's 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 going to be one of those soft skills, and I think it's just with any sort of migration is that you're going to have to work with those teams and say, hey, these are the pieces of code that we run. Be able to craft a session configuration file for that. Um, write testing to test that that configuration files meets those requirements and then basically implement and then, you know, rinse and repeat um, for each script or for each team and for each team, sorry. So I have a question. Say, and I've asked this a couple times, but I think mm. it's so useful because I think there's so mm. many there. Say I know some PowerShell. I've done some stuff. I've automated maybe a couple things, but overall my environment is not best practice. Mm. Um, right? Like maybe remoting isn't maybe properly configured all the way. There's no GIA, there's no uh, code signing, nothing. Where do people begin? If you're in that environment, you're ready to take the next step, where should we start? Because it can be a little overwhelming, I'd imagine. It is. Um, I actually make a bit of a comment in the book about this. And this is, I call it the, um, 
the four tiers of PowerShell security. Um, you've got script console, remoting, and um, code. So, um, so script is script execution, console is console execution, um, remoting, and yeah, and code. First thing I would start is with your code. Sign your code. Get I, and unfortunately we don't have this chapter yet, but abstract away your secrets to a, a vault. Whether and use Secrets Manager to do that. Get rid of plain text passwords in your code. Get rid of them. They shouldn't be there. Gone. Um, that's a good start because that essentially allows you to build on the other things. The four pillars, however, all have to be implemented for it to have an environment that is um, appropriately secure. And the reason why I say every environment, uh, every four pillar has to be, all four peers, pillars have to be implemented. And for instance, like script and console kind of overlap a little bit, is that what happens is without one, for instance, if you don't have GEO implemented, lateral attacks um, become a thing. And so having GEO in place can remove a lot of that. So it's, you need to make sure that you cover all your different bases to ensure that the environment is sound um, in its, but getting started, however, well, that's fine. Don't, 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 um, you know, don't bite off more than you can chew. Focus on getting your code up to scratch, getting that implementation, implementation, um, done correctly, script, sign that piece of code, have your certificates ready. Then when you're ready, move into console and script based execution. And then once you've done that, then the final cherry in the pie, I would say is Jira. Um, and the reason why is it can be a little bit complicated, but that's just because the way that I, within the book, I talk about setting up your role capability files using RBAC um, and basing the identity of um, using RBAC within Active Directory. So that means that what happens is you're not associating, you're associating the permission to a role, not to an identity. So it means that that role um, has that permission which then, you know, if you don't have an RBAC implementation within Active Directory, or if you don't have an R, you know, within your within an RBAC identity, um, you're gonna that'll be a bit more trouble, uh, a bit more difficult to implement because on that side of things, you have, um, you know, it, you're gonna be tying permissions to identities, and then if that identity leaves, you know, or that person decides to go and change a role they've had this permission specifically bound to that identity, which means that someone else is going to come in and they go, hey, I don't, know, I don't know what it is. So just making life a little bit easier from the manager, you know, the overview perspective. But um, the idea, and then that can be tackled last. So there's no, um, yeah, no right or wrong answer with it. But that, that's the way that I would kind of go about doing it. So you mentioned that you didn't have anything on the secrets module or pulling out the yep. passwords out there, but I love volunteering Andrew's time. And anytime I'm using secrets, I use his blog. So if you, mm -hmm. if you need a writer for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sign me up for writing. Your blog's fantastic is all I'm saying. Hey, it's a good module. It's easy to use. So hey. it, it's an excellent module. Um, there's, it's, it's funny though. Um, one of the things I've had at work is that the secrets module and, um, there's a, um, a secrets manager called Psychotic Secret Server or TSS. They have the exact same name. And when you have modules that are running the, oh, so, they, they, so they have commandlets that are exactly the same. So get secret exists on both sides. Um, yeah. Hang on one second. Um, my daughter's just said popped in. So one okay. sec, sorry. No problem. Hey. <laughs> What's up, sweetie? You want something to eat? Okay, can you give me two secs and I'll just quickly... Um, hey, we'll keep it right. rolling. Yeah, no worries. Okay. All right, I muted his mic, so we're chilling. So Jordan, man, I with that book that they wrote, right? That's so huge because I feel like there is a gap from knowing all about PowerShell to actually implementing it properly. They're, they're different skills, right? Coding properly and getting your scripts to run is different than securing your organization and making those types of changes. There, there's some overlap, but... It's uh and man, there's a lot of things in there that I am weak at, uh, and I'm curious if Jeff agrees as he says he has a plan for me to improve my thing. I'm testing collaboration. I'm awful at regex. I'm terrible at security. I'm, you know, I'm going to give myself a, a, a memory, which no, 
No, you're great, man. I mean, you're bringing up stuff. That's awesome. But with that security thing, man, I am really interested to read that because to me, that's where it's at. We have to get organizations more secure. We just do. I mean, it's better for so many reasons. We want to protect uh, our organizations. We want to have a secure world, uh, economy, but also well, we every companies time to trust PowerShell. There's a breach that happens through PowerShell. It's the bad press. Oh, PowerShell is used again. Like you have some companies that want to get rid of PowerShell altogether yeah. based solely on the bad press, even though all of the best, like the security entities are like, no, this is your best tool. Yeah, just configure it properly. Yeah, which so it's where we are, right? Yeah, it's, it's important. Then again, I do like the Wild West. It's just so much easier. It, it is so much easier. When, when, you don't, when you don't build anything meaningful like me, oh. just Wild West, just... Breeze on through. Wild West is good. The thing is, though, if you are going Wild West, I don't know. I, I'd rather not go Wild West with my approach. But welcoming oh. back, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks. Yeah, that's that's dad life at the moment. So I'm, uh, when well, my daughter woke up, I'm going to get a breakfast, get her ready. And my, 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 my wife's asleep at the moment. because That's she's, fair. Uh, yeah, what yeah, time is it for you? Uh, it's at 6.45, so. Oh, okay. Yeah. Good morning. And Claremont's want to know what was for breakfast. Um, Gluten-free um, cocoa bombs, which are like the equivalent to rice bubbles, but a lot cheaper. So, nice. okay. oh, sorry, rice bubbles, um, uh, cocoa pops, yeah. So, cocoa pops, okay. Yeah, so it was, it's, it's actually, uh, that, that's actually really interesting because a couple of um, years ago, I think it's like two years or a year and a half ago, I went, um, Went to the hospital for a food bolus, which is when you get food stuck in your throat, and then um, found out I had a condition with my throat, my esophagus, where it's like um, have uh, EOE, which is like a inflammation within your esophagus, and then basically also found out I was a celiac, and I was like, ah, oh. so celiac is rough. Yeah, it's 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 like I I, I don't say it anymore because I was like, if my life, you know, like I said before, you know, oh. I can't have cheese if I can't have lactose. My life's over. Mm -hmm. um, like I'm, I'm Italian, you know. I, I make my own pasta, um, and so and then I was like, if I'm celiac, my life is over. And I'm just like, I'm just gonna stop talking because I'm just gonna keep getting allergic to stuff, and then I can't eat it anymore. So. <laughs> right. My wife yeah. is celiac too, and <laughs> I've I've gotten used to it with her as we've discovered that. You, you become a better cook, put it that way. I think that that's that, um, like, to be honest, firstly, when I was diagnosed, I was pretty depressed about it. Um, but I think that the, the, it's kind of, you've got to look at it from a positive lens and go, okay, you know, what, where, what, what good can come out of this? And it basically just made that I eat healthier and that I make stuff from scratch. So, you know, when it comes to things like, um, a good example is actually, um, um, uh, chicken fillets. So, um, you know, I make my own chicken fillets from scratch with gluten-free breadcrumbs and they are amazing. I make my own, you know, I can make my own food, but I, I actually enjoy that. It's actually something that I found that I enjoy cooking. So yeah. Nice. I, I do like cooking. It's I like cookies, cookies, <laughs> <laughs> cookie monster. Yeah. We're, so, we're hopping back into the power shell. Yeah. I, I have a question. Oh, right? mm. How many? You're a two-time MVP, right? So now, obviously, I, we, we're talking about a huge accomplishment and achievement. Mm. But what were you initially contributing in the PowerShell world to get your first MVP? Oh, that's actually really good. Um, so I wrote a chapter for the PowerShell Conference book, Volume 2. Um, I also did a ton of editing on that book um, as well to get that, that book over the line. And I did I do a ton of work on Reddit. Um, and I run my own user, or run the user group as well. So um, I kind of, I was in this little constrained area. I would say, you know, you could say constrained language mode in my little constrained um, area, and I kind of just s sit in that area and focus on that specific thing. But I kind of um, wanted to do something bigger um, and, you know, contribute a lot more, especially within the, the wider community. So, yeah. So it's your user group, the Brisbane Infrastructure DevOps user group? That's just, correct, yeah. So, all right, so I, I just set up on, on YouTube, so if anyone wants to see that user group, there's some videos out there already kind of see what, what's happening in that one. Yeah, so we've taken a bit of a break um, over Christmas and February and January. We're coming back with March. Um, I'm just waiting on Gail to write me my um, quick, write me a quick um, blurb about 
um, this month, but we basically have speakers lined up this entire year now. So it's just, um, yeah. Um, so we're going to be back. Um, it just, yeah, took a bit of a break for obviously first of um, January and then February had, uh, family matters to attend to, which unfortunately meant that I couldn't make that commitment. And then March was, um, little, little bub. So, uh, sorry, I'm um, sorry. January was commitments. February was, yeah, was, um, um, Bob. So yeah, a huge congrats on the yeah, thanks, mate. I know we mentioned yeah. it earlier, but that's so yeah. awesome. So, well, what's your uh, name in Reddit? I know Twitter. Your PowerShell Michael. What's your name in Reddit for those that are PowerShell okay. Michael? Oh, same thing. Yep. Same look at thing. that. Look at that branding. I need to post on the PowerShell Reddit more. It's 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 something. It's really it's. Uh, there's one person on there that um, you know, Jordan Boreen. Mm -hmm. um, and it's so funny that when I like he occasionally posts on the PowerShells on Reddit, I'm just like immediately, guys, this is the correct answer. Ignore everybody else. Like he's one of the most knowledgeable guys I've ever met. And I'm fortunate enough to actually um he 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 lives locally. So really? I'm fortunate enough to have, yeah, have um dinner with him. He invited me to his wedding. It was really, really amazing. Wow, that's so, yeah, so cool. A, I had no clue. Yeah. He's on Discord a lot too. Yeah, he's on Discord a lot. He knows his stuff though, like you're saying. He knows his <laughs> stuff. Yeah, he's really, really knowledgeable. And like, um, and yeah, his family is 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 also Italian. So, you know, yeah, he, his um yeah, they have yeah. Um yeah, amazing. Like they're really, really, yeah, really, really fun to be with. Wow. I didn't yeah. know that. That's pretty cool. Small world. Yeah, it's a very small world. He actually comes from um a similar area of italy as well so um so we might be related somewhere from a marriage in italy but yeah that's nice. <laughs> <laughs> so we're talking about the mvp and i saw you have a selenium mvp what's it called the name of your module a cell mvp yeah cell mvp yeah yep. so what's that uh, I, I know a little bit about selenium but you use it for mvp contributions or what's going on there yeah so this is um one of these things where i wrote so when i applied to be an mvp for the first time you had to add all your contributions and that was uh single line contributions for each of your um the things that you've done and the idea is that i wrote this powershell script because i looked at this and i've gone I've got over 500 entries. I can't do this. This there's got to be a better way. And this was at the time that um, Adam released PS Selenium, and I thought, you know what? I'm going to have a look at this. So I basically wrote it a really rough around the edges script that allowed me to add um, at least all the Reddit entries into um, the contributions, and it just basically ticked through and automated it. And then I thought, all right, this is a great tool for everyone for anyone who needs to be able to, as a nominee, needs to add their contributions. Now, keep in mind at this point in time, once you're an accepted MVP, you have access to the API. You don't need this. You don't need Selenium. It's it's whatever. Mm. Um, and I was being, um, I was advocating really heavily for um, nominees to have access to the API. I didn't want them to be using Selenium. Selenium is kind of a, um a band-aid solution as i kind of see it um it's not something that i if there's a better way of doing it via an api use the api it's going to be a lot faster it's more concise there's going to be less issues the um the problem was is that um you can automate the um your your submission um basically as, as a parameterized input um but the issue is now that microsoft removed the api Oh no, what? So the idea for this module was that I actually wanted to delete it um, in the sense that I wanted people to use the API and I was strongly advocating for this. And so then when the news came around that they removed the API, um, you can see there was a bit of, um, um, that was a, a, a bit of a frustration around that. So what happened was they, um, yeah, the only module that kind of still stands up at this point in time is mine, but it needs a lot of maintenance um, because the fact that it's there's all these little new little issues that are popping up. But the Selenium um, PowerShell module is actually, uh, sorry, the, this, the MVP PowerShell module is um, written as a domain-specific language um, for similar to PESTA. 
So the idea is, is that you essentially write your activity or your contribution, and then basically you parameterize it. So you basically, um, you know, pass it through. And then I took it a step even further because I just thought that's not good enough. So the idea is, is that you can essentially CS, CSV import all your values, um, which is what 99% of the people will do. And what it will do is it'll actually dynamically write um, the, it'll write the the main specific language um, and then parameterize the CSV inputs into it. So it's it's really cool from a technical perspective. But like I say, automation is meant to be boring. Um, it sounds really silly, but automation is meant to be boring um, to the end user. They're just like, hey, I just want this to do this. Um, uh, but like under the hood, you know that like it's doing some pretty cool stuff. Like it's 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 pretty cool. Yes. Now, what is Selenium for somebody who hasn't maybe been introduced to it? What can it be used for? Selenium is really used, it's a web testing framework. That's probably the best way to describe it. It's a web testing framework, but you can use it to automate web forms. And it's really, it's really good for that. Um, another little project which I worked on was to, um, I automated Microsoft Rewards. So it would automatically go through and, um, generate, uh, you know, select all the different buttons and create a, uh, you know, for the Microsoft awards and, you know, do the, do the surveys and things like that. So, um, not going to publicly release that, but, um, cause then Microsoft will be not happy about that. But, um, I think that, uh, <laughs> but yeah, just automated it because yeah, you can do a lot of really cool automation within the, um, that, that space. So yeah. Shout out Adam Driscoll for that module, right? Yeah, huge shout out to Adam for that. <sighs> busy so guy. Great. Yeah, that, that <laughs> guy is busy. All the time. And then he runs a marathon. Like, <laughs> yeah, he, he was a fun guest just because I was exhausted just him explaining his day to me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. He's got some cool projects, though. Mm. And you mentioned Power Protect or whatever. What was it? PowerShell uh, Protect, yes. Yeah, PowerShell Protect. Yeah. You also work. That, that's a really interesting module, especially if you look at the, the, the code under the hood and how it works. Really, mm -hmm. really interesting, yeah. Nice. Yeah. Well, Jordan, you got some hard hitters today or what? You've been you, throwing oh. softballs? You, you're going to bring some hard hitters? Or where are you feeling, man? Well, well, no one's ever ready for the common parameters, especially when I can't find them and I forget what they are. Well... <laughs> yeah, I forgot what they are too. And the reason you forgot what, what they were is because I decided to write our notes all on top of it. So good luck with that. Yeah. They're, they're camouflaged in our notes. I, I think I have it. The problem is these questions are so difficult that even my own brain shuts them out and I don't have to answer them. Your eyes just like skip past it kind of deal. Yeah, I've been there. You ready, Michael? Yeah, let's do it. All right. What's one time something went wrong while on the job? How did you handle it and what did you learn from it? Oh, God. I got, I got, I got so many good stories. Um, I think the, I think oh, we'll, we'll, we'll do the very first, very first one because that's always a very entertaining story. And um, it's one of those things that you learn a lot from it. Um, so it's my first week in my very first IT job. I'm some junior help desk guy. This was back in 2009. Um, and my manager says to me, he's like, hey, we've got this really, really old, oh, we've got this UPS that we're wanting to use. And these are the back in the days when you had the UPS that basically had a battery pack and then it had a transformer that kind of sat on top of each other. Um, he wanted to change the batteries out and the batteries were gone. I'm like, yeah, no sweat, we can do that. And so what happened was um, there was a battery shop just up in walking distance and I went and bought um, four essentially right on mower size lead acid batteries. So these batteries are quite big, you know, they're quite, and they, they, they've got a lot of current through them. And um, so I pull the old ones out, go and buy these new ones. And it's about, you know, it, it's, it's a little bit of money, like it's a little bit of money. Anyway, so pull the batteries out, put the new ones in. Like and I, Electronics is, you know, I've, I've worked with electronics before, so that, and it's one of these things that I thought, um, yep, I've got this, chuck them in, and I'm doing the nut up on the final, um, the final terminal. I've connected all the other terminals together. I'm just doing the final nut up, and I accidentally crossed the terminals, and I arc weld the nut onto the bolt you, on on the terminal. So you cannot take that bolt off. And I sat there and I went and talked to my boss about it. And he's just like, "We're trying to undo it. There is nothing to be undone. Like this, 
there it is literally being welded onto it so the, i basically have to come to work the next day with bolt cutters to cut this bolt off so i did uh, i had bolt cutters in my backpack that really looked really uh suspicious <laughs> um and i cut it off and i was like okay no i've still got this but it gets worse so i put the bolt back i basically cut the bolt off put a new bolt on tighten it all up get the leads and everything and we got to plug it in into the um and this is you know these really really big thick cables you know the really big thick cables you have for your trailer when you basically like your trailer camper van you've got those really big thick you know uh, cables it's got one of these kind of i can't remember what the cable type is but the really you know really big square ones that anyway plug that in i reversed the terminals so it gets worse so we plug it in and a fireworks show starts but it gets worse <laughs> this is my first week in it and it gets worse at the peak of this fireworks show that's happening, the CEO walks in. And he's just like, what the hell's going on? And I'm just sitting here just like, oh, my God. Like, I can't, like, like, we're in a big warehouse, so there's nothing's going to catch on fire, but, like. It's not a good, so, not a good look for that. It, it seems to me. No. There's two takeaways from this. One is once you let the magic smoke out of electronics, they don't work anymore. Uh, the, yeah. the, sec the second one is you have a fantastic opportunity to put amateur arc welder on your resume now. <laughs> yes. And I'm lucky I didn't kill myself as well. Like, you know, good thing these things were insulated because if, if it's enough really to hurt. that quickly weld a bolt, then that's, uh, you're messing with some high current, some, some dangerous stuff you obviously weren't taking very serious. No, it wasn't. <laughs> and it's one of those things that lesson learned is that measure twice, cut once, that philosophy, <laughs> don't weld it, um, and really think about what you're doing. You know, um, think about the change that you're making and how it's going to affect something else. What's the impact? What's the risk? And like, I didn't think about that. Like, I've done electronics before, you know, I've done wiring, things like that. I was like, yeah, I've got this, da, 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 da. but it's like the moment there's complacency, within a high risk, high impact, um, mistakes get made and mistakes got made. And quite clearly it could have been a lot more serious than what it had been. So that's, that's, that's my big, uh, my big takeaway. Um, I've got many, 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 many other stories. Um, but I Oof. think that that's the big one. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. That is something I'm hoping that your new job pays a lot more and is a lot less dangerous. <laughs> I would say it's not a lot less dangerous physically, but there's still, you know, there's a lot of moving parts. So it's different. It's different in the sense that um, you got to, you know, um, this this wasn't from a from a cost perspective. This was minor from a cost perspective of my job at the moment. If I did something, it's going to be major. So um, it's it's yeah, it's it's all about different different uh, let's say, uh, different fields. Uh, so but similar risk, but it's important to make sure that you think about what you're doing. And that's something that young people don't do is they don't think about, like this is myself, it's, I just didn't think about, I was just so nonchalantly doing X, Y, and Z. And next thing you know, it's been big trouble. Yeah. Going through my twenties, I feel like I've felt my brain get more mature and develop <laughs> through the years though. It's, it's yeah. been weird to kind of go back and be like, wow, that was a lot more impulsive when I was younger. Yeah. I've been around my 20s for 20 years now. I'm still waiting for it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I found that the moment I had started having children and, you know, really entering the, the space, I like, I grew up a lot. So, and I think that was a really good thing. So, yeah. yeah. Shout out kids. <laughs> yep. Are you ready for the second common parameter? Let's do it. Right. With everything you know now. What is one tip you'd give your younger self when first starting IT? You cannot reuse welding skills. <laughs> um, yeah, like obviously don't cross terminals um, is a good start. But I think that the, the most important thing, there's two things. Um, 
And I, because I talk to students about this as well, and it's actually one thing I forgot to mention, I actually go and talk to students about this, is um, my, my um, I think Don Jones touched on this, and my, um, my, my mentor, Wayne Hoggett, he actually, um, if you guys could look him up, he's on the um, Cloud Guru. Really, we're really good mates. We've been mates, work colleagues since 2012, and then we've just been, ever since from that, we've just been really, really good mates, and we've learned a lot from each other. He's a really, really smart bloke. Um, he's the guy that taught me PowerShell. Um, but the, the, the thing is, is that he says is that you've got to never stop learning. Always be learning something new. Um, trying something new, doing something new. Um, the other thing which he mentioned is, and this is something um, for um, for audiences as well, what I'll say to younger people is slow down. Um, you don't know everything. Slow down and think about what you're going to do. And it's just the question, asking them, what's the impact? What's the risk? How are you going to, you know, if things go belly up, how are you going to roll this back? Those those kinds of that thought process um, for myself, I think, would be a lot um, would be um, a lot more um, help would help me a lot more thinking about yeah what can what would what potentially can go wrong and there's a lot that can go wrong. And it's just thinking about those things, exploring the, those options. It's not necessarily being so technical. It's thinking about the wider picture. So, you know what? Did you listen to our interview with Jeff X last week? No. You can say no. Okay, because he <laughs> yeah. gave a similar answer for that, mm -hmm. which was um, have an exit strategy like when yeah. you go to do something. And I think what you said was slow down, think about things. What's the impact? And if stuff hits the fan, how do we respond to it? And yeah. rather than just going and, and doing what you feel like is right in the moment. Yeah, I keep on hearing about all these kids that when they're young have all this self confidence, and I'm just wondering what that would have been like. I don't think I've ever suffered from that. <laughs> like, I, I don't, I don't. Uh, you might, you might, you can, you can, you can probably bleep this, but my boss basically said in the day, he's like, "Mate, you're young, dumb, you're young, dumb, and full of." <laughs> <laughs> all right, are you ready for the <laughs> third and final common parameter? I'm pretty sure that one will be removed. <laughs> Right. Uh, Demonetize. <laughs> Third common parameter. Uh, what are your three of your favorite modules? Oh God! So I think the Active Directory module, hands down, that's my that's my bread and butter. Um, that's that's something that I've used every day. Um, and I think it's going to have to be oh geez, it's Secrets Management. I love Secrets Management. I think it's an excellent module. Um, it makes my life so much easier. And then I think the final one, and I kind of gonna, it's a bit of a shameless plug for myself, but it's, I've been working on this module called SRDSC, um, which is Script Runner Desired State Configuration. Um, and the reason why I love this so much is because what I just, what I, I approached Script Runner and I said, hey, I wanna, I have this really cool idea where I wanna be able to take Gail's data module, um, take Datum or the PowerShell toolbox, um, and then marry it up into Script Runner. But the thing is, is that Script Runner is more a web GUI that focuses on, you know, simple automation, run the script, do the single thing. It doesn't really have the capability to manage, um, you know, to be able to add a node into desired state configuration. And I thought, okay, anyone could write a script to add a node, you know, into a YAML, you know, configuration file. That that's 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 nothing special. But what what this module does that makes it super cool is that the module it's dynamic, one hundred percent dynamic, which means that the script is is not immutable. It's it's it it will look at your configuration and then figure out what parameters it you need to input into when you create a new virtual machine. So if you if you have, for instance, a role, um, if you have a role um, defined within your um, your datum configuration, it'll automatically go, this is a role, and then parameterize those entries into the role. So that when you, so the idea is that when you have a help desk guy that goes to add a new virtual machine, he just goes click, 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 but is pre-populating all the parameters that he needs to populate. So it's a really, really interesting piece of code because the way that it works under the hood is it needs to pre-pass 
everything within the datum configuration and then reflect those changes into script runner. Really, really cool. Nice. And then the, the other side of that is basically it has a DSC pool server and then be able to invoke that one, um, publish the, uh, uh, compile the configuration and then publish those changes into the pool server. So yeah, it's really, really interesting. Sweet. Well, link below if you want to check yeah. it out. <laughs> It's incomplete, just so you know. Very, very, very beta. It's not even... Oh, alpha. Alpha. Yeah, alpha. alpha. Very, very alpha. Um, but it's it's very, very interesting, especially from a logic perspective. It's it's one of those pieces of code that... Um, it's shameless plug, but the idea is, is that the, the, new, the script that you use to create a new virtual machine is dynamically written. So it actually is dynamically writing the logic. So it dynamically writes the parameter input. Um, it dynamically essentially, and then the script itself, because it's a, it's a generic script, it then has to figure out what the parameterized inputs are. It uses, associates that inputs with metadata. And then basically using that metadata, it's able to do, um, able to insert a configuration entry into datum. Uh, uh, sorry, a, a, a new node into datum and put it in the correct path. That's pretty sweet, man. I it's swear. really interesting logic. Yeah. Like it's it's it's. I, I don't think I'm doing it justice, but it's really really interesting logic. But it looks remarkably boring when you go new virtual machine. You're like click click click. There's a new virtual machine, but under the hood, it's like doing all this really interesting stuff. So, like I say, automation's boring for the end user, and that's that's, that's a good thing. Yeah. Yep. All right. Well, Michael, I'm not sure if you know this, but Andrew's ability to shill has been said by some to be electrifying. So electrifying, in fact, that he could weld a bolt with just the use of his words. Just a wink. Just a yeah. wink. But so here, we're going to bring it up and we're hopefully he'll, he'll dial it back so we're not at risk, but he's about to shill our podcast in a way that the world has never seen before. All right, take it away, Andrew. I'm a man of the people. You, you may say I'm here to shill the podcast, but first and foremost, I'm here to shill the community, okay? We have an amazing book that everyone should definitely check out. Check out the Modern IT Automation with PowerShell book. That's where it's at. Leave a comment below letting us know what book was impactful in your PowerShell journey. We all have them. Maybe uh, we'll see some months of lunches, maybe some PowerShell conference books in there, maybe Modern IT Automation. If you have checked it out, bonus points if you tell us what you learned in this book, if you've already checked it out. Would love to read about that. Uh, give us a like, comment, subscribe. If you're listening to us on a podcast player, give us five-star reviews. Share this with your friends, your friends' friends, your coworkers, your cousin, your mom, whatever. You can hit us up at PowerShell Pod, or you can email us PowerShell at pdq.com. Michael, where can people find you? Because I know they're wanting to tap in. They're saying, this guy, he spearheaded this project. He's impacting the community. He's a nice guy. Where can we find you, man? You can find me on uh, Twitter at PowerShell Mike, M-I-C-H-1. PowerShell Michael is the, the name. You can just search that, see my face. Um, or you can, you can just uh, look me up on LinkedIn. So um, I'm on LinkedIn as well. Um, I'm on Reddit as well. So if you want to send me a DM on Reddit, PowerShell Michael. Um, I, I, I usually check my Reddit um, DMs once a day. So um, yeah, if awesome. you want if you want to hit me up, go from there. I'm all, and, and as well, I'm on the PowerShell Discord. Um, not very active on it at the moment because, you know, little one. But um, yeah, if, if, you, if you need to hit me up, just, just at me on that and I will, um, I will see it. Sweet. Awesome. Awesome episode, Jordan. I'm yeah. proud of this one, man. Yeah. This, Thank you for joining people. us. But it, it sounds Thank like you uh, having me. with how early it is for you, you should go get some breakfast before the baby wakes up. While you have time, man, run. <laughs> it's seven o'clock now. My daughter's my daughter's had breakfast, so I'm probably going to, uh, yeah, I'm going to probably do that. I'm going to probably have some cornflakes. So gluten-free cornflakes, but Ooh. yeah. <laughs> I hope this this uh, podcast ener energized you rather than just tapped all your energy for the day. Hopefully, you can just ride this buzz for the rest of the day. Keep going. I've got, I've got, yeah, I've, I've, I've got plenty of things to do today. So, um, um, many of them are probably going to be um, trying to feed Bub. So, um, but yeah, no, it's um, yeah, it, this was a great podcast. Thank you for having me on. Um, yeah, and uh, hopefully, maybe sometime in the future, we will talk about edition two. And then all the all the the juicy secrets that come out of that. Hey, look forward to it. <laughs> Thanks so much.
I thank you. Thanks for joining the PowerShell Podcast with your hosts, Jordan Hammond and Andrew Plaw. <laughs> What's the matter with you guys? <laughs> the PowerShell Podcast is a production of PDQ.com. 